go. Excellent. Well, welcome. Uh, this has been a great turnout. I know it's a topic as I travel the world uh, that is very popular and, and so we're delighted to have uh, two experts uh, to join us and think about not only what uh, VPI management looks like in their own context, but allow us to be able to think about uh, VPI as it relates to low income uh, or, or resource constrained contexts around the world. Um, so again, we're the Circle of Thought Professionals. If you're joining us for the first time, welcome. Uh, we do represent uh, about 25 different countries uh, and over 130 experts around the world or practitioners around the world. Uh, and our, our uh, goal for today is to, to hear from uh, Brian Summerlad and Debbie Sell, uh, and at the end to have some good time for discussion, uh, both through the chat feature, uh, through asking questions, and then eventually onto the Slack platform, uh, which we'll talk a little bit in a second. Uh, but we're delighted for the great turnout. Uh, to, we, we give thanks to our, our charity supporters. As you can see, there's a fair number uh, now uh, who have been recommending members, uh, participating in the discussion, giving resources. Uh, and today we want to recognize uh, Clef Charity out of the UK, uh, where both uh, Brian Summerlad and Debbie Sell are active, uh, who volunteered today to, to lead us through some of their thinking around VPI management. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I'll pass uh, the baton theoretically, over to, uh, to Debbie Sell and Brian Summerlad, uh, and, uh, and I know they prepared a presentation for us this morning, and uh, this is their first time, as far as I know, presenting yeah. on the Zoom platform, uh, so we all recognize uh, with new platforms, it, it, there's, there's lots of newness to manage, but uh, we're, 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 we're very confident that this is going to go okay. quite well. Right, sure. Okay. Um, hold on, just one second, I'm just trying to get myself uh, sorted here. I think we're doing okay. Excellent. Um, this is looking good so what far. What I can't see is that, Becca, the, um, can you see my screen there? Yeah. Yeah. What I haven't seen is that click to do the sound. Um, so you might have to stop the share and do it again. That okay. Might, it might pop up then. Cool share. Uh, stop share. Yeah. I missed it, I'm afraid. Um, okay share it was on the left isn't it on the bottom yeah, on the very bottom of the left oh oh it's it's on that's fine okay right ready to go can you see our screen yes okay um excellent it's very good in, um it's not in your full presenter view it's just... it's not in my whole presenter view okay just a second uh let's come out of that oh, just a second you slide view okay ready Perfect. Perfect. Well done. Okay. okay, sorry. Well, despite the practice. Um, so as you can probably see, it's our first webinar. But uh, we are delighted to be presenting on the management of VPI today together. And so uh, I'm hope that you can see both Brian and I. Hello. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Very good to be talking to you. So um, what we're planning to do is to talk probably for about 35 to 40 minutes and then we really want to have some good discussion. So we know uh, when we talk about the problem of VPI how prevalent it is in low resource countries and that's partly because there's an, uh, a group of unrepaired patients um, who have established their speech or patients that have had late repair or poorly repaired and also we know that it's the normal consequences of a, a cleft repair at, a, at, an, at, a, at the correct time. Um, there is evidence of a reduction in the incidence of VPI, um, particularly where teams are working together, but we know there are really very particular challenges in, this, in low resource countries that of older patients, um, who've got severe speech disorders as well uh, in terms of their articulation. Large groups of untreated VPI exist and there are many non-team care settings and the surgery itself. So what we're planning to talk about today is perceptual speech assessment, investigations and surgery, Brian will do this, and then a few controversial issues at the end to try and uh, think through some uh, discussion points. So we're going to start with the speech assessment and we know that this is absolutely at the core of the management and assessment of velopharyngeal dysfunction or VPI. 
And yet cleft speech or speech associated with BPI is very complex. There are several interacting parameters which are each assessed at the same time and having influencing each other. And also there are unusual consonants often that don't occur in the sound system, system of the listener or the speech therapist that's rating that speech. We know ideally that we should have semi-narrow phonetic transcription. So a busy slide, but just to actually highlight using the GOSPASS speech assessment, all of the parameters in red that are relevant to the assessment of VPI. And that actually um, here we can, in the word initial and word final position, transcribe uh, the consonants um, that are, uh, we are hearing and actually abstract that information and summarize it into these cleft speech characteristics listed down here. We'll talk about that in a moment more. Particularly important in a VPI speech assessment, uh, perhaps to add in is the mirror test. The issue of sound stimulability, how easily patients can perhaps elicit, be, uh, elicit those sounds which are not in the sound system. And we may well be using nose holding as part of that in our differential diagnosis. And in all of this, we're looking at the consistency of these features. Um, and this again tells us a lot about whether or not we need surgery or, or therapy. What this also highlights is a systematic approach to assessment with the documentation and the importance of the speech sample which one controls to hear different aspects of these parameters at certain times. So just to highlight here the typical consonant errors associated with VPI for those less familiar, we know that there's a group of what we call passive errors directly related to the velopharyngeal in, insufficiency. So for example, the sounds but and uh, produced as mm, mm, mm. and uh, another group of sounds that are classic in a VPI are those made in the uh, out of the oral cavity in the larynx, the glottal stops, uh, for example, here in the pharynx, pharyngeal stops and fricatives, or here the uh, nasal fricatives, the non-oral errors. In addition, posterior errors, sounds that should be made here but are made further back in the mouth, may also be associated with VPI. So it's a, appropriate to have a word here about the universal parameter system, which I know is widely used in low resource environments and appropriately so, uh, where there are no speech and language therapists, I think. However, we do need to make sure it has proper psychometric testing and its validity is reported. But also we need to acknowledge that there is no phonetic transcription in this tool and that actually one only has a binary presence or absence jud judgment um, of a characteristic. And really it's not sufficiently detailed for clinical assessment. So having done our speech assessment, we as speech and language therapists are making a speech differential diagnosis. Are these characteristics associated with VPI or, and or fistula? Uh, hearing, is there a motor in coordination problem? Sometimes a dyspraxia diagnosis is given then, or is it that it's a developmental uh, there are developmental um, errors in the sound system? And often it's a combination of these things that we need to tease out. We can think of VPI as speech characteristics as being active or passive as a pattern, or sometimes they can co-occur. But active suggests that there is a problem of velopharyngeal insufficiency mislearning or velopharyngeal mislearning. Um, and often that's associated with needing therapy, whereas passive does suggest uh, there's a structural problem and you need investigations and probable surgery. So we talk about these two ways of looking at speech. But there are also particularly important aspects of the case history in children presenting with VPI that we need to also pull out. Pull out. The issue of nasal regurgitation, the issue of sleep and snoring and sleep apnea and perhaps a child that's a little bit overweight or an adult and the implications of surgery for those patients. Uh, but these, all of these, uh, this speech assessment and these issues need to be seen within a holistic framework of the child's development and whether they have learning issues, whether there's associated syndrome and issues around their education. Because also this will inform the need for speech therapy, 
um, whether or not they've had speech therapy or going to have it in the future. And if they have had, what has that therapy been? How much of it has been delivered and by whom? So we've got some idea as to whether or not they've had the appropriate therapy. And then, of course, any other medical issues that are co-occurring, especially those that may prevent safe surgery or um, hearing problems. But most importantly of all is this one at the bottom here is the patient and family perspective of the VPI related aspects of speech. Uh, they often tell us about other things, such as language development. Um, and in particular, gathering their motivation for surgery, gathering their motivation to engage in speech therapy if that's needed. So which patients on the basis of the speech assessment then need to go forward for investigations? I would say certainly those that present with consistent hypernasality. And this may co-occur with frequent nasal air emission. But where nasal air emission and nasal turbulence are occurring in isolation and there isn't hypernasality, in a low resource context that might not be considered a priority. Often consistent hypernasality does go with passive cleft speech characteristics and certainly those are indicators for investigations. And in addition, it co-occurs with glottal and pharyngeal articulation, although we do need to be aware, of course, that some patients may present to us who actually have had surgery for their velopharyngeal mechanism and it's been successful, but they are persisting with these articulation errors which need to be addressed in therapy. And you wouldn't necessarily send that patient for investigations. I would suggest also where there are persistent posterior errors with suspected um, that don't respond to therapy, you may well want to suspect uh, tongue humping, so some masking of the velopharyngeal insufficiency. Um, so that might be another group. And those children who we see perhaps in the first two categories, hypernasal and passive, who have poor stimulability for consonants. So we're now going to turn over to Brian, who's going to talk us through investigations. So what should those investigations be? Uh, surgeons tend to rely on looking in the mouth and uh, all around the world I hear surgeons saying, oh, that palate looks short. Actually, you can say very little about the, the, the functional length of the palate from uh, looking in the mouth. However, you can say quite a bit, you can look for fistulae and you can look at the position of the levator. So here's a normal palate and a, a repaired cleft each of them saying ah and you can see the point of maximum lift of this palate is in mid velum here very anterior the levators are still anterior our most important investigation is lateral video fluoroscopy because you can do it in young children it's non-invasive it shows you the relationship between the palate and the pharynx it shows you where the levators are and you'll see that later. It, it gives you an idea of the vertical relationship between the palate and the pharynx. It shows you the thickness of the adenoids and you can see tonsils, the shape of the nasopharynx, whether the tongue is contributing to closure, and you can actually make measurements from lateral video, video fluoroscopy. Disadvantages, there is some radiation. We reduce it to a minimum. You can't see lateral pharyngeal wall movement and you can't detect asymmetry. So here's a, a patient just to demonstrate. If you're looking for the reason that the So the lateral video fluoroscopy should be short. We use this little toy to keep the head still a two centimeter ring to make a measurement before each recording. We do not use contrast. There's the viewmaster and the ring. And here's the setup in a normal image intensifier. But if you don't have that sort of Im image intensifier, many hospitals in most parts of the world have C arms and you can get a very good lateral video fluoroscopy image from a C arm. And here's the sort of thing that you Endoscopy can be very valuable. It can show you the shape of the velopharyngeal aperture. 
It does tell you about asymmetry and pharyngeal wall movement, what the adenoids look like, the shape of the nasal surface of the soft palate, pulsations, for example, in 22Q11 deletion, but it's difficult in small children. It's a very distorted view. You look through an endoscope at a bit of type and it doesn't look anything like type. So you're not seeing the real thing. You can't measure and you can't assess vertical relationship. And I think because of that failure, there's been a lot of misunderstanding about velopharyngeal function. Here's Debbie doing a, an endoscopy. And in the UK now, uh, um, endorsed specialist language therapists can do endoscopy. So here, for example, a palate, the concave soft palate before and after a re-repair. So really the investigation that you favor depends to some extent on what your surgical emphasis is. Because we are talking about palate surgery primarily, lateral video fluoroscopy is by far the most important investigation. If you're looking at, if your primary surgery is midline pharyngeal flaps, then endoscopy does become important. You can't always do sleep studies, polysomnography, but you do need to think about sleep. You do need to think about the nasal airway. And if you can do a, a sleep study, if you're considering, for example, a fringoplasty, that really is very important. So after these investigations, we then decide what we're going to do. Possibly nothing, possibly speech therapy, possibly prosthetic management. I'm going to talk about surgery. Many years ago, I became very unhappy with pharyngoplasty and particularly midline pharyngeal flaps is the primary way of dealing with VPI. They do have significant complications, early complications such as hemorrhage, even mortality, and late complications such as hyponasality, nasal obstruction, sleep apnea, difficult nasal intubation, and particularly for midline pharyngeal flaps, which are, is a very unphysiological operation, frequently, in my experience, tethers the, the velum down. is difficult if you're going to move the maxilla forwards and are difficult to revise. And also, it seems to me they often lead to atrophy of the palate muscles. The muscle stops trying to, to work normally. Obstructive sleep apnea is a very important problem. It's more common, the more you look for it, the more you'll find it. And it has a serious effects on a child's development, on schooling and general health, producing all sorts of complications, pulmonary hypertension at worst. It was felt that sphincter pharyngoplasty was less likely to produce obstructive sleep apnea, but the, I think the evidence is that it's probably just as likely to cause that problem. One paper from Taiwan, after midline flaps, 90% developed obstructive sleep apnea, of which 50, more than 50% were still moderate or severe at 12 months. And that's a, that's a really big morbidity problem. So what we should be trying to achieve in, in velopharyngeal dysfunction surgery is both to improve velopharyngeal function, ideally make it normal, but also to maintain a good nasopharyngeal airway. So our philosophy is if the levators are anterior, as, as seen through the mouth, but also on lateral video fluoroscopy, then we would first carry out a re-repair. Here, for example, a three-year-old girl with a repaired cleft palate saying E. You can see the gap, you can see the anterior levator knee. So we split the velum in the midline, we expose those anteriorly inserted levators, or in this case, palatopharyngeus muscles. We retropose the muscles, here's the left levator, and join those muscles up much further back in the midline of the velum, in the, at least the posterior half, sometimes the posterior third of the velum. And very importantly, um, divide the midline scar because if that's still tight, then the villum will not extend. So before the operation saying E and afterwards, you see the more posterior levator knee and closure six months afterwards. And the big advantage of the re-repair philosophy is here, 
is this patient seeing E before and after re repair, but at rest, no significant difference in the nasal airway. All of the papers we've published have used this method of external blind assessment of outcomes of nasality, nasal emission, nasal turbulence before and after, and the color coding system which we developed where green is normal and red is bad. So you can see each of these patients or has moved towards being better. Not all normal, but significantly improved. It works better if the gap is small. One, so here's no, three, more, more, seven, four surgery. Bobby made me more gentle than getting on the mask. Bobby's a baby boy. I saw Sam sitting on a bus. I saw Dan getting on a larger gap before. Ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And after. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Say ah. So in this series of 85 patients, no significant complications, and it is low morbidity surgery. And we've published the outcomes in two papers with, with external blind assessment of outcomes. So if the levators are anterior, that's our first choice in most cases. If not, then we have two main options that we use. One is the what I call the posterior wall augmentation pharyngoplasty, a modified Heinz pharyngoplasty. The other is buccinated flap lengthening of the palate. The Heinz pharyngoplasty involves splitting the velum and raising mucomuscular flaps superiorly based from the posterior lateral pharyngeal wall. And those flaps are then overlapped inset high on the posterior pharyngeal wall and that level is determined on lateral video. So here is a velum, the velum is split, here's the arch of the atlas and just to show you how much higher these are than for example the orticogia. These flaps are inserted just below, in most cases just below the level of the eustachian orifice. So here's the incision and then this would be one flap and the other flap and they then inset across the posterior pharyngeal wall at that very high level. It's simply making a bulge. It's like creating adenoids um, at the correct level. It's not a sphincter pharyngoplasty. Most of them done at an older age, between five and 10. Uh, this is a paper from Felicity Mahendley showing nasality, the, how the reds and oranges and yellows move towards greens in external um, blind assessment but very importantly very little evidence of hyponasality this is not an obstruct this is i think the least obstructive pharyngoplasty but it is still obstructive to yeah. Here's a good counts to 10. ten. One. Four. No. Four. you do it two three And here she is Two, after a high string of plasma. So you see this, five, this bulge six, of string creation. Seven, eight. And another patient Two, after a repaired cleft. So here he is before surgery. Four, seven, eight. Nine. Nine. Ten. Uh, pee pee. Mm -hmm. Can you say, I saw Sam mm -hmm. sitting on a bus? Mm -hmm. Good. Bob is a baby boy. Mm -hmm. Good. Mm -hmm. And then after, well, I just got after a real well care, can you see how he's put it up there? But he still has a small gap. Mm.
Yeah. And so six months later, we And so if you can leave that sign on its own, just really think about putting your lips together and going. I'll just show you that a little bit. I hold him hand on the mouth. Bob is a baby boy. Bob is a baby boy. Now after the hand three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Brilliant. Can you say ah? Ah. Okay. However, the hand is not an easy operation. It's difficult to do. It's potentially dangerous. There is some airway obstruction, as Felicity has shown, and there is a risk of se secondary hemorrhage. I've had two cases having secondary hemorrhages at five to seven days. And so we have moved more and more to doing, using buccinator flap lengthening of the palate as an alternative. And this is a paper from Greet Hens, uh, published in the Cleft Palate Journal, showing these two flaps inserted, separating the soft palate completely from the back of the hard palate. I don't use bite blocks um, and don't necessarily divide the pedicle. So here's the patient. This is the incision, separating the soft palate from the hard palate. The left buccinator flap raised, the right flap raised, there's the right flap, and inset into that gap between the soft and hard palate. And immediately at the end of the operation and three weeks later with a nice pink flap. Just one patient to show you how these palates don't look very pretty. One, two, three, is a four, rather five, thick looking six, palette. However, seven, you see eight, the achieving palette. Eight, 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 da, da, da. Da. However, the lengthening is actually less than you might expect. Although we put a one to one and a half centimeter wide flap in, the lengthening is mean lengthening in the paper by greet of our patients was a lengthening of only seven and a half millimeters. However, 77% of them achieved closure. And again, the random, the externally blindly assessed uh, assessment showing the improvement. So it's an effective operation, it's safe, relatively easy to perform, very good if you're doing a simultaneous fistula repair, but still some patients need further surgery. So this is the philosophy. Maximize velar function, reassess, and if VPI, a Heinz or a buccinator flap, but I would not personally be doing a Heinz plasty in many of the countries where I now work, in Bangladesh or other countries. If you have a fistula, uh, the, the buccinate is very good at, at closing it, but you need to be sure whether the fistula is causing the problem. And it's very important for surgeons, if they're working without speech and language therapists, to realize that a fistula may not be the problem. The problem may be velopharyngeal. So, for example, if there's a fistula here, then if the patient says k, you won't hear escape. If they say b, you will. A surgeon can assess that, perhaps using a mirror. So be very careful not just to close a fistula, assuming that's the problem. And as I've said, be safe. And especially in, in, in countries without ideal facilities. So to finish, if the levators are anterior and the palate's long enough, we repair. If, they're, if the palates are posterior, in other words, we've maximized palate length, but the palate's just too short, buccinator flap. If the palate, if the levators are anterior, but the palate definitely looks too short, then now I would actually combine a buccinator flap with a re repair. And we would do that. For example, in this case, by also closing the fistula, so making an incision like this, but also a midline incision in the velum and insetting those flaps, one flap orally, and that flap coming forward also to close the fistula. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Brian. So for the last few minutes we're just going to be looking at some contra more controversial issues perhaps um, and uh, very quickly to go through these so firstly I wanted to talk about the role of therapy for example for hypernasality in the absence of articulation difficulties and then for uh, the articulation difficulties related to VPI so let's see what we can see 
So taking therapy for hypernasality in the absence of articulation difficulties, we can see that there is a real mismatch between the surgical literature and speech therapy literature. So surgical literature almost always recommends routine post-operative speech therapy. The speech literature, however, talks about therapy being inappropriate for most patients with velopharyngeal problems. So the reason for this is if we look at the techniques that are available for hypernasality, we can see that um, these two at the bottom, uh, there's some, some sort of relatively weak evidence for these. Um, and, and, but if we look at non-speech activities such as blowing, we know that this does not improve hypernasality in isolation. And the behavioural techniques such as increased mouth opening, uh, there's neither any evidence for this either. Indeed, there's just been a, patient, a paper from the Ghent group, a controlled study, which has shown that this is not effective for hypernasality. So we don't really have any techniques. In many, in many cases, hypernasality after surgery is because of a structural persistent problem. So our recommendation is that it, where there is closure possible and you see it very well on endoscopy and x-rays but it is inconsistent that is the only time you would be thinking about a trial of therapy for uh, trying to correct that residual hypernasality um, if it's not associated with articulation difficulties. Let's think about articulation therapy. And as we've indicated already, active errors due to mislearning, we can be effective and we can change those patterns. Uh, hence that differential diagnosis is so important. And we can treat articulation difficulties in the presence of VPI. Oftentimes changing articulation when that is present is a more long term it's much more hard work for the children uh, but with um, the right therapy certainly one can in increase the use of um, uh, voiceless consonants the, uh, uh, in the, uh, that are being used for glottal stops for example but one wouldn't necessarily be able to change those voiced consonants if there's still VPI but there is something you can do but our thinking is that we should only really be putting patients into that type of treatment for fairly short periods of what we would call diagnostic articulation therapy where we're determining the potential to change consonant errors with therapy. I'm now going to talk about issue two which is the timing of interventions. Should it be therapy first or should it be surgery first and so there are really two schools of thought here um, speech therapy before surgery is not only possible but advisable in contrast to VPI should be resolved before therapy intervention and this really goes back to what the surgeon's protocol is for investigations and protocol for surgery so if we think of the pharyngoplasty pharyngeal flap school, they would be advocating therapy first, then surgery. And this goes back to that thinking that's been really um, somewhat more historic these days, but still it, literature that we will read, which is the importance of lateral wall movements in deciding uh, pharyngoplasties, pharyngeal flaps, and that actually where there are glottal and pharyngeal articulation, that actually there are no lateral wall movements occurring. In actual fact, that rule um, doesn't always occur. I've seen many patients who have had that type of speech on endoscopy and do have lateral wall movement. So it's not necessarily always the case. But when people are in this school of thought, they will want to have children having one or two oral consonants, i.e. in front of the velopharyngeal mechanism, in their investigations. So they send them off for therapy for that, which has the impact of delaying the endoscopy to later and also of course that information is used the endoscopy and information is then used for determining the nature of pharyngoplasty but there is a, a delayed element to um, in, to intervening the palate school however is a little different so we would be saying perhaps not as a not not for every case but as a rule of thumb that maybe one would get on with surgery and then do therapy because all we really need is a moving palate with anterior elevators on a lateral video fluoroscopy to make decisions about going in for surgery. 
So we would be thinking about lateral video fluoroscopy is the only investigation that's required and that you can then go in at younger ages. And sometimes our aim is actually just to get enough intraoral air pressure so that actually the child is then facilitated in therapy for their consonant articulation work. And always go back in and do, as Brian has just shown you, another operation if they still remain hypernasal. So here, let's look at this little girl um, who had her, uh, she had a very limited uh, x-ray with uh, not the typical speech sample. She was only... Daddy. 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 Good. Say mummy. Say Cora. Uh, say Daddy. Yeah. And this was her after her surgery, she would be after. Oh, good girl. And that one is a... Yeah. Good girl. Should we turn over? Quickly, quickly. What's that one? Oh, a duck louder than me. Good, say mummy. So I think we can see there the um, the ability to go in earlier with these children if when if we're and with a very a relatively limited speech um, speech sample on the lateral video fluoroscopy. What's our third issue? Well, this is about how long does it take before you know that the patient's not going to change their hypernasality after you've gone in and done a palate re-repair. And there's been a recent paper by El Sabini um, who suggested it should be at least 12 months and that after that surgery, you need continued speech therapy. In actual fact, the paper was based only on clinical data. They only reported emission and nasality. They didn't tell us anything about the consonant production. And they used actually an unvalidated tool, the Pittsburgh scale. Um, and yet what we, they were probably seeing there was an improvement related to their articulation getting better, resolving nasal fricatives and glottal stops that also are associated with hypernasality. And indeed, we've written to the journal about this. We're not sure how long it takes, but in truth, there are many patients that come back after a successful palate procedure six months later and we have resolved that problem. So this is wrong to wait 12 months as for every patient. Okay, what are the special challenges of that manage, of VPI management in lower resource countries? We know that there are either no or few therapists or very perhaps inexperienced therapists with limited, limited supervision. And we've seen, haven't we, here how this must have implications for the assessment, that speech differential diagnosis, uh, being able to make recordings, the prognosis for speech improvement with surgery, which we would obviously discuss with the surgeon, and most importantly, perhaps also is the therapy and its provision. In that situation, surgeons need a good understanding of cleft speech or v speech related to VPI, what can be changed with surgery alone and what needs to be changed with therapy, and also to understand the timeframes for doing these activities. And then in terms of patients, is there a need to think about who we should be prioritizing? Um, and also this issue of their follow-up, which is a real challenge and a particular challenge where you have a severe speech disorder and you're looking at therapy. So our final slide. In conclusion, palate procedures for VPI do have a place in less safe environments. Nasendoscopy is not essential when you're doing these procedures, simplifying your assessment and investigations, and you don't always need those preoperative oral consonants. Surgery is possible at younger ages than if you're doing a pharyngoplasty, and surgery is less risky than pharyngoplasties. So thank you for your attention, and I'm now going to stop sharing. Here we go. Oh, hello? Thank you so much. Debbie and Brian, uh, right on time. Wonderful. You can hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. And, and I'll uh, just put my video on. Lovely. You can see me too. Um, wow, lots of information uh, to, to digest. I really appreciate also your emphasis on uh, starting to think through what this could look like in lower resource or resource constrained uh, environments, which I know both of you have lots of experience uh, in working in. Uh, so, as I mentioned off the top, we do want to spend a good 20 minutes uh, discussing what we've heard, uh, asking questions. Uh, there was all those that slide deck was really uh, insightful and informative. So uh, again, just to, in case anyone's nervous about that, we we have recorded this and it will be going on the Slack template, so you can watch, read through, and and uh, and refresh uh, what we've just heard. Uh, but before we get started. Um, 
and, and again, in a second, please feel free to post questions in the chat feature or signal that you'd like to ask a question and, and I'll acknowledge you. Um, it's quite exceptional in some ways to see this, uh, a joint presentation. Uh, Debbie and Brian, you're on the same screen. Can you talk a little bit even about that, that journey to having a really effective co um, collaboration between a speech therapist and a surgeon in terms of cleft care? Um, let, let me answer that. I, I, think, um, I think it's a very important learning experience. Uh, I, I see around the world surgeons trying to make assessments of speech and really not understanding, you know, not understanding that a, a patient with poor articulation is not going to suddenly get better after an operation, for example. And so some of the surgeons who are participating will have speech pathologists that they work with, and that's great, but some will not. And um, they have to become, they have to learn some of the principles of, of speech. Um, to, for example, I talked about fistulae and understanding whether a fistula is the cause of the problem. So uh, I think uh, I, I've learned quite a bit about speech, but I don't claim to understand everything by any means. And I think probably Debbie has learned a bit about what a surgeon can do and can't do. And, and that's where it's very important. And I think, I think the problem in many countries is this hierarchical business that uh, you know, so the surgeon is sort of seen as the top of the tree and there are other people that are lesser beings. And what's happened in the UK and the US and Canada is very fortunately that we are, that everyone is now seen as, as equals and equal professionals. But that is not the situation in many parts of the world. And hopefully that will gradually change. Thank you, Brian. Debbie, what would you like to add to that? Uh, well, I certainly uh, endorse what Brian says. I think doing regular clinics with your surgeon um, and Brian and I for a while were working on a weekly clinic and just seeing many, many, many patients with VPI. And then you get to learn and know, importantly, the outcomes that your surgeon is likely to achieve. Um, and I think that's really important as a speech therapist because you do actually have quite a, a voice in saying actually I really think this patient needs to have therapy uh, needs to have surgery and so it's quite a responsibility um, and hence that whole thing of looking at outcomes is really really important and having that equal relationship um, um, and uh, I don't I also would say that actually with every new surgeon you work with you have to work out that relationship um, and you have to um, work out what their uh, outcomes are going to be too and it doesn't automatically mean that because you've had a fairly equal relationship with one surgeon that actually the next incoming surgeon is going to work in the same way so it's very much a, a, a team together working but it's about working very regularly learning about surgery as Brian says I know a bit more about it but at the end of the day I'm not a surgeon so thank you Fantastic, and, I, and I, that was a very, I heard a very practical uh, indicator of that, uh, the idea of joint participation in clinic uh, as a, a, a chance for both of you to learn a little bit more and have that discussion while you're actually looking at patients as a, as a key step forward. I wonder if that's something that we can be thinking about in our own context. Mm -hmm. uh, I do see a question coming up here uh, from Dr. Giant in India. A wonderful presentation, Dr. Brian and Dr. Sal. Question uh, to Brian, with respect to palate resurgery, after muscle repositioning, you mentioned about releasing the scar in the midline of the nasal layer. Does this mean you excise the scar, retaining the nasal layer intact, or do you remove the scar to the point of dividing the nasal layer if required and then restructure it? Could you please clarify? Okay, um, if I'm simply doing a re-repair, uh, then I, I, I divide that scar and I may reflect it back a little bit but I, if you do it with it I do all this surgery with a knife with a scalpel not not with scissors and if you if you do it with a, a knife the knife cuts through scar tissue uh, and if you're lucky if you're careful it shouldn't cut through the mucosa I try carefully I try not to divide the mucosa in that situation if I'm if I'm simply doing a re-repair if I'm combining my re-repair with a buccinator, then all then that becomes a redundant step because I'm going to completely divide the nasal layer and the scar in in the process, so that it's no longer necessary. But I, but it's important in a 
in, in a simple re-repair. Thank you, Brian. Other questions? And Dr. Brian, thanks you. I see our, our friends at Calvo McKenna in Santiago. Please go ahead, Karen. I have a question to Dr. Debbie Sell because we were right recently coming from from Peru, where we ha had a, also a U.S. friend, Dr. Ann Kummer, as a speaker, and she was very um, ag aggressive in saying you don't treat articulation problems prior to VPI surgical correction. So um, I understand if you do a cleft palate re-repair or just a re-repair, it makes sense that you would just say, assuming it's like a primary cleft, you have to operate it because the muscles aren't really in the best position. But if you're thinking about a Heinz resolution or a flat resolution, what do you think about first correcting articulation problems, thinking that you will have maybe better wall movements, or would you just go as Dr. Ann Kammer suggests, surgery and that surgery we will solve the most of the problems um well i i think certainly i'm I, I, we wouldn't be worrying about the lateral wall movement in this protocol however what i do think is important is and and of course when you're doing a very brief <laughs> overview uh, sometimes things get missed out but what i do think is important is that where where children have some stimulability for sounds meaning that the therapist has found that they are able to um, to get some sounds that they're not using in their typical speech then quite often as therapists we will say oh let's do some speech therapy first and then see how that influences speech and often sometimes parents need that time to understand that um, your um uh, to come to terms with doing surgeries and that's and particularly if you're doing something more complex than a palate procedure which is less risky than doing anything of the other options we talked about so that's um my immediate reaction so i don't think there isn't one rule for everyone either every child is different so those children that have passive articulation and you know they've got the right place of articulation in their mouths and all you have to do in in inverted commas is to repair the velopharyngeal mechanism issue they go straight for surgery other children we may think actually we're going to keep them back a bit and do a bit of therapy to maximize what's there so for example that i i didn't elect to show you any videos of children today necessarily on the internet uh, but um there was one patient who you know we've done masses of therapy she's got all her voiceless consonants but she can't ever she'll never get her voice consonants um and so without something being done to her velopharyngeal mechanism so it is very much well, that's what's so important is that assessment by the speech therapist to determine how much is that is needs surgery or we can do something and in that discussion with your surgeon you'd be you'd be debating it and saying you know we should, perhaps should hold on a bit give them some therapy etc etc and then of course it's the issue of can they get therapy is there a therapist to give them therapist a therapy thank you debbie great another quick quick question uh debbie you, you mentioned that the the one instance where you recommend uh treatment for hypernasality if it was if it was inconsistent mm -hmm. In a, in a resource constrained context where sometimes equipment is, is difficult to, to find, how would you recommend assessing the, the uh, consistency of hypernasality and then determining whether, whether speech therapy would be effective or, or not? Well, using your ear, but probably isolating consonants. So doing syllable repetition. Um, and if, if it is, it may well be that on certain um, if it's inconsistent, you'd be seeing closure if you were able to look with the scope on certain aspects of speech, but not all the time. And the ear would tell you that, but it needs to be, I have to say, a, a, a bit of a trained ear in hearing that, that distinction. Um, but so that's one thing. And also using perhaps a mirror, although that might mainly picks up emission rather than nasality, which is the thing we were really talking about. Um, so those those would be my I don't know I'd ask that to others in 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 the context. Yeah, well, we've got some very experienced context. SLPs. Uh, yeah, we'll throw that out to the group. What's your question or comments? Building on that or something else? I'll see Suraj okay. first, and then we'll go back to Karen. Suraj first, please. Thanks. Okay. Uh, thanks you. Hi, Debbie and Dr. Sonlad. Nice to hear you. How are you doing? 
Okay. So my question is to Dr. Debbie is, uh, what is your uh, um, take on intense short-term intensive therapy for uh, patients who underwent VP percussion because uh, the context which you were talking that you know patients do not come for follow-up so mm -hmm. what is your take what what is your idea on that short-term intensive therapy oh definitely if that is an option and the patient has potential um, and i think kate crowley crowley has actually talked about this as well um that actually if you can get patients there with their families and you can then spend time uh, training the family as well to to be doing um articulation work so definitely that is a probably a more effective way uh, if that is an option and certainly in our um speech at home work which uh, work speak not homework speech at home project uh we're very interested in in training parents properly um to give them training to to then work with their kids on their speech so but that intensive approach definitely if it's an option thank you debbie uh, i said uh karen or Mirta next and then tim bressman also has a comment or question no regarding uh assessment what do you think debbie and also dr brian samalak about nasometry this wasn't mentioned in your talk is it a good tool for only investigation for treatment do you use it for assessment if you don't have a speech and language therapist available is nasometry a tool that a surgeon can use or is it only a tool that a speech and language therapist has to use it yes fantastic question thank you that's a, very, that's a very good question. Uh, no, I didn't put it in my talk. Um, indeed, yes, on our VPI clinic, we used nasometry uh, and actually it, it was a helpful adjunct to the ear. There's no doubt about that. Um, and uh, with more sort of evidence and particularly after using in speech prosthetics as well, we, it, that was very interesting to see the outcomes. I've never worked with a surgeon that's just been in isolation using nasometry. So I, I, I talk not from experience of that scenario, uh, but I do think that it, it can be misleading um, because we do know that nasal turbulence elevates those readings on nasometry. Um, and actually, if there is a particular articulation difficulty as well, then actually the ear needs to be able to determine that actually the reason that it is so hypernasal sounding is because the patient has a lot of active nasal fricatives um, and that's can re that's not a surgical issue it can look as though it's very high nasometry but actually needs therapy so it goes back to actually the same thing at the end of the day the perception and working out what's going on in speech is is really the the um the key and i think if there'd been a machine that could do it we we would we would have it have it have it and i don't think nasometry it can be misleading so uh, yeah i, I don't you. think i did i don't think we've ever made decisions just on nasometry no, that's, no, that's the important true. thing i think um if you're in a situation where there are no speech if a surgeon is in a situation with no speech pathologist it's better for him to go off to a course and learn a bit about speech than mm. rely on a, on that machine i would feel mm. Right, uh, that, that, that's been a theme I think through this is, is the, the need for shared learning among surgeons around speech and speech therapists among surgery. So thank you for that. So, uh, Tim Bressman, do you have a comment or question? Oh, sorry, um, I'm trying to unmute myself. There you are, we see you. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for the great uh, talk, Debbie and Brian. And actually just on the, uh, point of nasometry since you just <laughs> put that right there um, we just had a, a paper accepted in the cleft palate journal where we suggest doing the nasometry first and then doing the perceptual assessment and um, we can actually well in, in that retrospective study um, that actually improved agreement between experienced listeners quite substantially uh, so there may be some value to nasometry and um, the reason that it sometimes doesn't seem to agree with our perceptual agreement uh, assessment maybe that um, we're not so good agreeing with each other um, with auditory perception anyway enough with the uh, self-promotion uh, the question that i had um, was uh, what do you see as the role of post-surgical swelling there's quite a bit of swelling after all these palatal operations and i've often wondered whether that's really what makes speech therapy a little bit more uh, 
um, successful because now you've got much smaller gaps between the velum and the posterior pharyngeal wall. And you're more in a newborn situation, really, where you have a very tight nasopharyngeal sphincter, and it's much more realistic for the patient then to achieve closure with even a little bit of movement. If you could just comment on that. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think the, the, the swelling issue is more relevant, obviously, in something like a Heinz pharyngoplasty, where the patients are often quite obstructed, sound quite hyponasal immediately afterwards, and then that resolves. I think it's much less of an issue with re, with re repairs. Uh, it's not. Uh, it, it is a factor, but it's not a big factor. So, we after Heinz, we'll often see patients to, where parents say, "Oh, that's you know that they're all blocked up," um, and that that remedies itself. But I think this issue of timing and Debbie raised it, and and um, and, and how soon after you can really assess the outcomes of surgery. I think is it is some. It's an unanswered question. Um, David Orr from uh, Ireland has done a, a, a review of re-repair um, papers and suggested you should, and only included the series with 12 months follow-up, which excludes ours because we've routinely done them at six months. But he may be right. We just don't know. So I think coming back to Debbie's um, question about the paper by my friend Ahmed El Shabini, we, 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 it would be very good to know um, more accurately, how long it really takes for 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 the the structure of the palate and the velopharynx to improve, and that's especially valid in 22 Q11, as mm. we've as we've learned over the years. These patients can improve for a for a long, long time, for years. So, and why is that? What's the what's happening? A lot of unanswered questions. Thank you. Well, colleagues, um, I think, you know, really almost even on those uh, controversial issues that uh, Debbie and Brian worked us through, we could probably spend uh, productively a whole hour on each one, if not more. Uh, but uh, I see that the time is tight and all of us, uh, I know, have busy days. Uh, before we, we wrap up, I'd just love to, to invite Debbie and Brian to give us a quick overview of the CLEF charity. Uh, I think many of us are familiar with, with Debbie and Brian as individual practitioners and experts. Uh, but maybe not so much with uh, the charity that uh, through which they've had a lot of this international experience. So just very briefly, could you give us a quick overview of what the CLEF charity is and, and where it's heading? Yes, thanks, you. Um, I'm currently the chairman of, of, of CLEF. Uh, um, we set it up 2007, and it actually does two things. It, it, it funds research by our team by Great Ormond Street and the Institute of Child Health into causes and treatment of CLEFs. But we have a, a limb which is becoming more and more important uh, um, of supporting cleft teams in low resource countries and it's really a little bit different from the it, it, it's different from the mission concept and it's dif different from the funding the surgeon concept it's really helping to set up establish fund in the short term perhaps multidisciplinary teams in low resource countries who will undertake to look after patients all the way through from birth to maturity. So not, not concentrating on primary surgery, important though that is, but looking at, at team care in the long term, comprehensive cleft care. Uh, and we have a major project in Bangladesh and we're also working in, I'm going tomorrow to Kurdish Iraq um where 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 we're working uh I, is permitting and um uh uganda egypt sri lanka um and we're actually looking at expanding that that work in the uk more generally actually uh i'm i'm talking with a number of other surgeons to try to to build that that kind of it's a different concept to to the to the existing not transforming faces who are, are very much in the same going in the same direction but very different from the traditional cleft ngos i heard a figure in uh, in peru when i where i was there with karen that um it's estimated that 75 percent of cleft care around the world is uh, is paid for funded by ngos what happens when those ngos finish what happens if they go bust you know what 
what sort of vacuums are going to be left. We must be building long-term sustainable centers. Thank you, Brian. And obviously it sounds like uh, even more topics for potential webinars in the future to continue this discussion. Yeah, it'll be very uh, controversial. Val valid, valid for sure, and, and definitely close to our hearts. Uh, major thanks, uh, heartfelt thanks to Debbie and Brian uh, for giving up their time and preparing this, uh, especially amidst the difficult, busy travel, travel schedule. Brian will be thinking of you as you travel to a very um, interesting part of the world that's in the news right now. I mentioned off the top, we're thinking about our colleagues in Santiago who are uh, on the call also, and where we're, we're hearing about what's happening there, and in a lot of the countries in which there's lots of uh, instability or, or things that are interrupting potentially our patients' lives. Uh, and so, uh, again, thank you very much. Join us again shortly. I'll ask Becca just to go on to the next slide. Um, we, are, we do have our next uh, uh, seminar very shortly. So again, with a speech emphasis, it just so happens. Uh, so we'll, we're, we'll be, we're, we're thrilled to have Dr. Kate Crowley uh, who Debbie mentioned in her presentation, and Pam Sheeran from Smile Train to talk a little bit more about building capacity internationally for speech therapy uh, in post cleft palate repair. So, uh, you know, definitely building on some of the things we've heard today. If you have more questions or comments or observations, uh, again, there was so much richness and experience in this group uh, that we didn't hear from everybody with the time we had. Please consider coming on to Slack uh, and we'll, con we'll look at trying to, to resource those questions that you might have. Uh, Slack is also the place to look for a recording of this webinar so you can review it, show it to colleagues. And if you do, would you, if you do have a colleague who would love this kind of discussion uh, and be part of our monthly webinars, uh, please invite them to, to uh, apply. It, it takes about five or six minutes uh, and our, our, our numbers are growing. Uh, so again, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, if you do have any comments, please feel free to send them to info at clefcircle.org uh, and we'd be pleased to respond. Uh, again, thanks to our presenters and to everyone participating today. Uh, and we'll see you hopefully uh, on November 5th. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.